Hey gang, welcome to the long overdue reading of Littlest Lovecraft Presents The Call of Cthulhu. This is the book that uh, I had an unboxing video for a while back. Uh, for those of you who maybe knew it or missed it before, go check that out. Uh, but when I was unboxing it and kind of showing off the stuff that came along with this Kickstarter product, I had asked you guys if you would want to see a, a reading of the book. So that is what we are going to do today. Um, I really wanted to have an actual webcam or whatever on the book as I'm turning the pages and reading it off and stuff to you guys, but it just it didn't work out. I couldn't get it right. Um, the quality of my webcam isn't the best. I didn't spring for top notch or anything like that. So instead, what I decided to do is I have a ebook version um, that came with my order of this. So I'll have the images up on screen for you and then my reading playing along with that. So hopefully that will work out, hopefully you still get the feel of it. So basically why I want to do this is I think it's a really cool product. I think Shrorex and Iona Bella did a really good job turning The Call of Cthulhu to kind of a kid's book feel. Like that's kind of how it looks and feels, Littlest Lovecraft and all that. Um, they did a great job on the artwork that you guys will all see shortly here. But yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, I really want to kind of show off what they've come up with. And also, it's really a good introduction to Lovecraft's work. If, uh, if you're someone who isn't familiar with it already, or maybe you're not a really a big reader. I know a lot of people don't get into books as much as they used to. So this is going to be kind of a light, easy to consume introduction to Lovecraft, The Call of Cthulhu. So I hope you guys enjoy this reading of the book. I will have a link in the description to an HTML version of the full story written by Lovecraft of The Call of Cthulhu if you guys want to check that out for yourself if you like what you hear and see here in Littlest Lovecraft. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Littlest Lovecraft presents The Call of Cthulhu by Tro Rex and Aeona Bella from the papers of the late Francis Wayland Thurston of Boston. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is that mere mortal minds just cannot comprehend. We were not meant to fathom the vastness of time, or the reach of the cosmos, or things without end. While some may have guessed at this terrible breadth, just the knowledge of strange eons did this to me. Dark visions of horrors were burned in my brain. In the end, there are things you can never unsee. I learned of these first when my granduncle died. Professor Angle left his things all to me. I sorted through these till a box caught my eye. It was locked, but I found and soon twisted the key. Within the locked box were a number of files, along with an uncanny clay bas-relief. Upon it was sculpted a strange sort of beast, with peculiar hieroglyphs drawn underneath. The papers as well were a curious bunch. The Cthulhu cult, the manuscript said. Cultists and secrets and madness abounded within the two stories I picked up and read. On the first day of March of 1925, a sculptor named Henry A. Wilcox stopped by. He came in to ask the professor's advice on a clay bas-relief just now starting to dry. Odd hieroglyphs clearly showed some sort of phrase, but Wilcox had no clue just what they could mean. The professor then asked him from where it had come, and Wilcox just said, I made it last night in a dream. The young man recounted a strange rambling tale. There'd been a small earthquake just one night before. This had somehow inspired his mind to conceive of some terrible place on a far distant shore. Peaks rose from the sea just like great jagged teeth. The city that crowned them was untouched by men with sky-high stone spires that dripped with green ooze, and the unending drone of Cthulhu Fathagen. Professor Angle was enthralled by these dreams. For weeks after that, he met Wilcox each day. He asked about cults, but the young man knew not. Cthulhu and Rillier were all he could say. Then Wilcox fell ill with a fever and dreamt. He cried out in the night, and he ranted and raved. He spoke of a thing that was miles high and monstrous, that was surely the beast that in clay he'd engraved. On April the 2nd, his fever then broke. He woke with no recall of what had gone on. Along with his illness, to Angle's dismay, all traces of Wilcox's strange dreams were gone. 
And so the professor then searched for more clues. He sent letters to ask if more people had dreamed. New England at large had quite little to say. Not much was amiss for most people, it seemed. The artists and poets had visions instead, reporting strange nightmares as young Wilcox had, and fear of some great nameless terrible thing. One man even died, having gone raving mad. Along with the writings, I found other clips from journals and tabloids from all the world through about voodoo and beasts and mysterious cults. I suspected young Wilcox had read these things too. In the very next paper that followed, I found what one time before the professor had seen, this terrible thing and those ominous names. Cthulhu, really, yeah. what did they both mean? A number of years before Wilcox stopped by, the Archaeological Society met. Professor Angle had attended the meet. It was there he first saw what he'd never forget. Inspector Legrasse brought a strange statue in. He had come up to learn of the odd idol's past. It was found in the swamps south of old New Orleans, when police had dispersed some dark cult's dreadful mass. The scholars all gathered in close for a look. They passed round the statue from one to the next. It was ancient and queer and exquisitely made, but they just shook their heads, all quite truly perplexed. A professor named Webb then stepped in to declare that he'd seen something like it a few years ago. In Greenland he'd come on a similar piece, with a bloodthirsty Eskimo cult down below. Legrasse then asked Webb to recall, if he could, the chant he had heard from those terrible men. The words Webb then spoke were the same he had heard. Fungluwi Muglunaf, Cthulhu Riliach, Wagnagl Fathagan. Legrasse had won up on old Webb, it would seem. The cultists he'd captured had told him its meaning. That gibberish chanting went something like this. In his house in Rilie, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. At that, they all asked him to tell them the tale of how he'd acquired the queer statuette. Legrasse told the men of that far distant swamp and the fiendish and strange band of cultists he'd met. In New Orleans last year, the police got the call, about women and children abducted at night, about things in the swamps and of dark voodoo cults, of screaming, drums beating, and unholy fright. Inspector Legrasse and nineteen of his men leapt into their cars just as fast as they could. They were armed to the teeth with a local to guide, and raced down the road to the dark haunted wood. When the path grew too wild, they got out and walked, through brush and the bog till a sound spooked the men. They heard a loud chant over ominous drums. Fungluwi Maglanaf, Cthulhu Reliach, Wagnagl Fathagan. They came to a clearing and saw through the trees a hundred men circling a great ring of fire, their voices and arms raised in bloodthirsty praise as they worshipped a statue atop a stone spire. Guns raised, the policemen dove into the fray. The cultists all fell, or surrendered, or fled. While the rest of his men were securing the scene, the inspector recovered the idol with dread. They worshipped great old ones, the cultists declared, who had come to this world before men came to be. The old ones still whispered to men in their dreams, though they lay in the earth and down under the sea. The statue they found was Cthulhu, they claimed. It's he who is called in the chant they were screaming. The phrases they shouted were meant to say this. In his house in Rilie, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. One cultist, old Castro, told bit of strange tales of the old ones who reigned and then died long ago, laying somewhere within the Pacific's deep seas, but just where they slept only high priests may know. They were only alive when the stars are all right, and fell into sleep when their own time had passed. In great houses of stone in their city relief, they wait for their fated rebirth at long last. The first men to dream of them formed the dark cult around statues they'd crafted of eldritch design. And to keep the great truth of Cthulhu alive, the cult cannot die till the stars realign. Time passed and Rilie sank under the sea, drowning their links with the minds of their men. 
But the memories lived on, and so too does the cult. For some day, Relia will rise up again. The core of this cult was, Old Castro proclaimed, concealed beneath the Arabian sands. In the ages old city of pillars they kept the secrets they gathered from faraway lands. It is said that these secrets are hidden within the Necronomicon, whose pages decry, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. With that the inspector concluded his tale. The grass for some time lent the statue to Webb, as he fancied himself to be quite the collector. On Webb's death it returned to the prison instead. It was not a surprise Engel linked the reports. The cults found in both must be one and the same. It was quite plain to see if you knew where to look. The papers had printed that hideous name. These surely inspired young Wilcox dreams. He must have concealed his knowledge before. Determined to speak with the young man myself, I went down to Providence to bang on his door. Frail and unkempt, Wilcox answered my knock, but as we conversed, I soon found him sincere. I then pressed him to tell me his curious tale. He knew nothing of cults, though, that much was clear. He told me his dreams of that frightening place, of the city of stone and that hideous call. Cthulhu Fatagan. Cthulhu waits dreaming. Still, I couldn't believe he'd just dreamt of it all. Unable to banish the cult from my thoughts, I went down to speak to Lagrasse and his men. Though Castro had died, the dark idol was there, but I couldn't believe in the dreams even then. I suspected foul play in my granduncle's death. He'd been pushed by a seaman, a cultist in fact. I believe he was killed because he knew far too much. Who knows now what dire notice I might attract. My quest for more answers had sadly gone cold when I noticed a Sydney news bulletin spread. It pictured a statue of some dreadful beast, like the one that Legrasse had retrieved, and I read, Mystery! Two men recovered, one living, one dead, found drifting at sea on a derelict yacht. Survivor speaks little about baffling case. New inquiry sparked by odd idol now sought. Early in April 1925, a storm-damaged yacht the alert had been spied. The crew of the Vigilant came to her aid, but just Gustav Johansson had somehow survived. The man in Norwegian then told how the yacht had scuttled the ship where he'd been second mate. In the fight that ensued, their men took the alert, but later they met with some horrible fate. This was clearly fresh news of Cthulhu's dark cult. At last I had questions to ponder anew. What of the idol, and where was it found? What fate had befallen the Emma's lost crew? Could these things be linked to young Wilcox's dreams? The dates all lined up, I soon realized with dread. The dreams and the myths of the old one's rebirth. I could almost believe now in all I had read. I traveled to Sydney as fast as I could. The survivor had answers I just had to know. But, though I could see his strange idol myself, Johansen had gone with his wife back to Oslo. I left soon for Norway, his address in hand, but when I arrived I found he had since passed. His widow at length gave his papers to me, so I read them with haste, seeking answers at last. It began when the Emma was blown off her course, and ended up lost in the deep South Pacific. They were set upon there by a yacht, the Alert. Her terrible crew was both strange and horrific. The Emma was hit, and eventually sank. Her captain first mate and another were lost, but the rest of her crew somehow took the alert. The battle was won, but at such a great cost. They spied off the bow rising up from the sea, a foreboding lone mountain, Acropolis crowned. As they neared, they could see some queer statues on top, with massive stone blocks and sharp spikes all around. The Emma's crew moored and went down to the shore, to the mud-covered base of a spiraling stair. Non-Euclidean geometry baffled the men, as they climbed to the foot of the monolith there. At the top of the stair they beheld a great door. As they opened the portal not one of them spoke. It swung wide with a flutter of wings and foul stench. Then deep in the dark, great Cthulhu awoke. 
Like a mountain that walked, he burst out from the door. His great scaly arms were both starting to rise. Just a swipe of Cthulhu's immense flabby claws, and three men were thrown to their tragic demise. Two other men died just from fright where they stood. One more fell, but Johansson and Bryden could flee. They raced to the shore and then made for the yacht, while Cthulhu flopped down from the stairs to the sea. As they reached the alert, the men started her up, relieved that her engines were prepped from before. But Bryden looked back and then promptly went mad, as Cthulhu pressed on through the waves past the shore. Johansson could tell it would catch the alert, so he cranked on the wheel and he spun her about. As the thing's massive head rose above the ship's bow, he drove the yacht on with a desperate shout. He rammed the alert straight on into the thing. Its head burst apart with a loud slushy rip. The stench of a thousand old graves roiled out in an acrid green cloud that fell over the ship. Not pausing, Johansson passed through and away. Cthulhu reformed, but Rilie was gone. It pulled the thing down with it under the waves. Then at last it was done, and the yacht sailed on. Aboard the alert was an idol enshrined that depicted the beast they'd so narrowly fled. Johansson soon found himself drawn to the thing. It drove him half mad and consumed him with dread. Soon his duties meant little to him any more, as he searched for some meaning in unyielding stone. Johansson hid safe in the berth while it stormed, but poor Bryden was left to the squall on his own. It was out of that squall that the vigilant came. Johansson was saved, but poor Bryden had died. When they docked, he told newspapers some of his tale. Then he went back to Norway, his wife at his side. He put pen down to paper and gave his account, but he wrote it in English to spare his dear wife. The memories broke what was left of his mind. Then a bundle of papers fell, taking his life. When I came to the end of the story at last, I locked the notes in with the clay bas-relief. I then hid the box far away from my sight, as if I could hide from my new-found belief. I looked on the horrors of time and of space, and it left me this poisonous stain on my soul. I now know too much, and the cult still lives on. I fear soon they'll come take their terrible toll. Cthulhu still lives, sleeping under the sea. He waits for rebirth, and he dreams in the deep, for that which has sunk may rise up once again. And still his dark cult seeks to wake him from sleep. I pray that whenever I pass from this world, some caution is used by my heirs of estate, to see that this knowledge is hidden and safe, lest they be caught up by the same dreadful fate. The End